Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, we started a brand new series called Battle Ready, and the purpose of this series is to inform us of the spiritual battle we find ourselves in, but not just to let us know about the battle. The purpose of this series is for us to engage in the battle and start walking in the victory that Jesus has won for us. And so with this in mind, this morning, we're going to be looking at the victory we find in Jesus alone from Luke 10, 38 through 42. So you have a Bible. Let's meet together in Luke chapter 10. And as you turn there, let's pray together one more time. Lord, the song that we just sang rings so true. All of our lives, you have been faithful. All of our lives, you have been so, so good. But so often we get so preoccupied with the things of this life and the tyranny of the urgent that we forget just to be and to know you. So as we open up your word this morning, my prayer is not that I will preach a good sermon or that it'll be informative. My prayer is that your Holy Spirit will come screaming out of my mouth as Houston has prayed. That your Holy Spirit will do what only he can do, and then pierce our hearts with the goodness of your word. And by your word, convict us, strengthen us. And for the one in here who does not know you, my prayer is that you will save them today. Help us today to walk in the victory you have won. We pray all these things in the only name we know how. In Jesus' name, amen. So you may not know this about me, but one of my favorite hobbies or activities is to partake in escape rooms. Just show of hands, how many of you have ever done an escape room? All right, a few people. So you kind of know the general premise, but for those of you who don't, you're essentially locked in a room for 60 minutes. And the goal is to escape the room. I mean, escape room, it's in the title. But the goal for 60 minutes is to escape the room by solving a series of puzzles that will eventually lead to you either getting a certain key or a certain pen pad combination that will unlock the door and open it for you. Now here's my little humble brag. I am currently 10 and 0 when it comes to escape rooms, which means if you want to do one with Renee and I, uh, I will vet you and call three references to make sure you're good. If you're a first-timer, you're paying, because then I can say all the ones I've paid for, I've won. Okay, but I love escape rooms. They're a lot of fun. I love the puzzle. But there's one escape room in particular that I remember kind of fondly, but not really. It was when I was a student pastor in Worthville, Kentucky. It's about 2019. Myself and two of our adult male leaders took the youth boys to Chick-fil-A and to escape room. Because if you go on a church event, you go get Jesus chicken. It's what you do. You don't go to McDonald's or Popeye's, you get the blessed chicken from the Lord. So we took them there, and then we went to the escape room. Now this little piece of information I'm about to tell you seems irrelevant, but it's the key to the whole story. For lunch that day, I had a spicy Caesar chicken salad from Wendy's. That is important for later. So anyway, we go to Chick-fil-A, we eat, We then go to the escape room, and I'm really proud of those boys. Within 10 minutes, they solved three or four steps of the puzzle. They were doing great until about that 30-minute mark. And then they started acting like middle school boys, not knowing what's going on, not knowing and getting frustrated with it. But I'm also not doing good either. See, I started the night real strong, but about 30 minutes in, I knew, I think Wendy's gave me food poisoning. And I'm locked in a room. For 60 minutes. Some of you know where this is going. (laughs) So when I started, I was real strong. I was doing good. I was helping the boys. Me and the adult leaders were trying not to solve everything. But by 30 minutes, I started to feel it. And when I started the escape room, I was standing. About 30 minutes in, I was sitting. And with 10 minutes left, I was laying on the floor in complete misery. And finally, we had two minutes left, and I gave up. I told the boys, look, here's the code, here's the password, enter it in, we're getting out of here. Sure enough, we got out with two minutes to spare, and I just remember being completely miserable that entire time. I mean, it started off good. About 30 minutes in, I knew if we didn't get out soon, they were not going to allow us to come back to that escape room. 
But I just remember that misery just laying on the floor, wondering how many more puzzles do I have to solve to get out? How many more puzzles do I have to go through? What more do I have to do to have victory in this escape room? That was miserable. Miserable because I didn't see the end in sight. The boys weren't figuring it out, and I had to do it on my own. But that same misery I've felt that day in that escape room, I feel like is the same spiritual misery many of us find ourselves in when it comes to the spiritual victory we want. We start off strong. We're ready to go. We're getting at it. But as we keep going, we burn ourselves out. We wear ourselves out. We start wondering how much longer until I have victory, how much longer until life gets better, and then we're just miserable. You see, the reason we're miserable is because we've made the assumption that victory is a puzzle to solve. But in spiritual warfare, victory is not a puzzle, it's a person. You don't have to solve a series of puzzles to find out how to have spiritual victory in your life. You don't have to solve a series of riddles or pass a couple different tests to have victory in your spiritual walk, with your, in your walk with the Lord. Victory is found not in a puzzle you solve or in what you do, but in Jesus. Your victory is not found outside of you, it's found in Jesus who lives and dwells in you. So as we talk about spiritual victory, we talk about having victory in the battle. We need to know what do we have to do to have victory? Where do we find victory? How do we have this victory that's only found in Jesus? And I believe a story from Luke chapter 10 about Mary and Martha tells us what we must do to begin living in this victory. See, Mary and Martha are about to learn a very valuable lesson, and that's the right choice is always being with Jesus. Look at this passage with me beginning in verse 38. But while they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha You are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken from her. So Jesus has just told the infamous parable of the Good Samaritan. We all know the Good Samaritan. We all feel convicted by that parable. And Jesus has just told it, and now they're traveling once again, him and his disciples. And they come to Martha's house. And we know it's Martha's because, well, Luke tells us this is Martha's house. This is not Mary and Martha's house. This is Martha's house. So they come in, and Martha starts to do everything she thinks she could do to get everything ready for Jesus. I mean, she's cooking. She's cleaning. She's doing whatever she's got to do to make sure that Jesus and his disciples are comfortable, to make sure Jesus is happy, to make sure Jesus feels at home with her. And as she's doing all of this, this cooking, this cleaning, whatever else it is, she notices Mary's not doing anything. Now just, again, be a little interactive here. Show of hands. How many of you have had been consumed with a to-do list just to look around and see that nobody else is helping and you're doing it on your own? Just show of hands. All right, most everybody in this room. So you all know how Martha feels at this moment. You know what Martha's going through right now. You know that she is frustrated. She's annoyed. But notice, she's not just annoyed with Mary. Who is she also annoyed with? Jesus. Because who does she go to when she's frustrated? Does she go to Mary and say, Mary, would you come help me? No, she goes straight to Jesus. And notice her accusation. Lord, don't you care? The Lord of all creation. The Lord who loves her. The Lord who later on is going to raise her brother from the dead. Lord, don't you care? Lord, don't you see all that I'm doing? Lord, don't you see what all I'm trying to do for you? Lord, don't you see all of this? Why are you letting Mary just sit at your feet? Tell Mary to help me. And we know this how the story goes, and we go and say, yes, Mary made the right decision, but if we were to be honest, most of us have a Martha Christianity. Especially in the culture we live in today. We're real good at doing 
We're real good at doing the right things, doing what we think we're supposed to do. We're all good at having that checklist and marking off the boxes as we go to where for many of us, our quiet times with the Lord is just something to check off. I read my Bible. I did my plan. I'm ready to go. I pray because I'm supposed to. I go to church because I'm supposed to. I serve and help with fall festival, which you should do if you haven't, because I'm supposed to. I go to Sunday school because what I'm supposed to do. And we do all of this, and we miss the point of why Jesus saved us. We're real good at doing. But you know what happens when you have a Christian that's all about what you do? You're guilty of what Paul has rebuked others for. What began with the Spirit do you now seek to accomplish in the flesh? See, we think everything in Christianity, our walk with Christ is about what we do, but Mary teaches us it's not about what you do. It's about being with Jesus. So that's foreign to us. What does it mean to be with Jesus and not just to do? After all, we serve Jesus. We know how to serve Jesus. We, does it mean we study about Jesus? We learn more about Jesus? Is that spending time with Jesus? No. See, when Renee and I were going through premarital counseling before getting married, you know, premarital, we had to do what was called the five love languages. Now, some of you may have done this. I think it's really good if you're married, if you want to just kind of figure out each other better. Five love languages, fantastic. But out of those five love languages, I learned that my love language that I show people is gift giving. Which means if I love you, I buy you a gift. You haven't got a gift from me? Well, <laughs> read between the lines. But anyway, <laughs> but that's my primary love language. I'm a gift giver. Renee is not that way, nor is that the number one way she receives love. You know what she is? Quality time. Quality time. Now, I thought that meant as long as I'm in the room with her, that's what, as long as I'm next to her, as long as we're in the same premise, that's being with her. There's a big difference between being around my wife and being with my wife. There's a big difference between me doing things for my wife because I love her instead of being with my wife because I love her. See, I can do a lot of nice things for Renee. I can buy her gift after gift. I can make it to where her life is easy and she never picks up another dish in her life. She never cooks another meal in her life, which might not be a blessing. I can do all of that. But if I'm not with her, I don't learn just to be with her. Then I'll never really know her. And I'll never really enjoy her. I'll just be re real good at doing things for her. And a lot of us have that kind of Christianity. We're real good at doing things for Jesus. We're real good at doing what we think we're supposed to do. I mean, after all, the things I listed earlier, those aren't bad things. I want you to read your Bible. I want you to pray. The Lord wants you to do those things. I want you here on Sunday morning. I, I want you here when we have something going on. There are things, I, guess I want you to be doing these things, but not at the expense of being with Jesus. See, oftentimes what we do is we judge somebody's growth, somebody's spiritual health by their involvement. Are they at everything? Are they at Sunday school? Are they at service? Are they at Wednesday nights? Are they at the Bible studies? Are they at the fall festival? Are they at this? Are they at this? Are they doing this? Are they at this? We should be judging people by, are they walking with Jesus? Are they meeting with Jesus? Are they growing in Christ's likeness? Because here's what you need to know. The Christian life was not meant to be lived inside the walls of the church, but outside the walls of the church. You're not meant just to meet with Jesus on Sunday morning. You're not meant just to meet with Jesus on Wednesday night. Jesus calls you into a relationship with him to be with him. So we can be Martha's. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do all these things. But doing that is not birthed out of being with Jesus will burn you out. It will exhaust you. It will frustrate you. And it'll very quickly make you just like the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2. You do all these things in my name. You hold to right doctrine. You've got the right Bible studies. You know all the facts. But you've lost your first love. 
See, we read about the church of Ephesus, and we wonder, how did they lose their first love? I would argue because they weren't with Jesus. They knew how to do things for Jesus. Which one characterizes your life right now? The Mary Christianity that's with Jesus or the Martha Christianity that just does for Jesus? Do you spend more time knowing and being with Jesus or more time serving and studying Jesus? Which one do you think Jesus wants you to do? Does he want you to spend all your time doing and running and accomplishing all these things? Or does he want you to be with him? Which one does Jesus prioritize? What did he tell Mary? Or sorry, what did he tell Martha? Mary has made the right choice. Martha was doing everything she thought she needed to do. But was she happy about it? She was frustrated about it. Was Martha excited that Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus just gleaming everything she could from him? No. She wasn't doing what Martha thought she should be doing. So she was angry, but ultimately, who was her anger at? Was it at Mary? Is that Jesus? Lord, don't you care? Lord, don't you care that I'm doing all of this in your name, yet my life is in shambles? Lord, don't you care that I've done my Bible study? I, I pray a lot. Lord, don't you care that I'm at Sunday mornings? Lord, don't you care that I'm at Sunday school? Lord, don't you care that I'm at Wednesday nights? Lord, don't you care that I volunteer for fall festival? Lord, don't you care about all of this, yet my life isn't what I want it to be? Lord, why is it I don't have peace? I'm doing all these things for you, Lord. Why don't I have what I need? Because doing for Jesus will never bring you peace and joy that comes from being with Jesus. Be with him. It's not about doing. Can I, can I be honest with you? I would rather you do less to be more. Jesus would rather you do less and be more. Because guess what he doesn't need you to do? He doesn't need you to do works for him. He wants to work through you. What's the difference? Always doing versus learning to be. And that's hard for us. Can I make a confession to you? I'm not good at this either. Either. I like to do. I went to seminary to learn how to do. I got two degrees all about doing. I'm getting a third, learning how to do. But you shouldn't want a preacher who does preaching well, but hasn't met with Jesus. Would you rather Somebody come to our church who's real good at doing and they can do everything you ask them to do. Or somebody who knows how to be with Jesus. See, this morning in my devotional, I was reading about the story of Peter. Now, you all know the Apostle Peter. Many of us do. The disciple who majored in foot and mouth disease. Okay? Peter was, well, Peter's funny, but Peter's also the most relatable disciple we have. Peter started off strong. Peter left everything to follow Jesus. Peter abandoned everything. He left fishing behind. When Jesus told him to put the net on the other side, Peter did it. Peter said to the Lord, when Jesus said, who do the crowd say that I am? Or who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And Jesus tells them, flesh has not revealed this to you, Simon, who is now Peter, upon whom I'm going to build my church. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Spirit has revealed this to you. Peter's doing great. At this moment, a lot of us would want a hundred Peters in our church. But Peter had not yet died to self. Because in the very next verse, when Jesus says, the Son of Man must suffer all these things and die, what did Peter do? He pulled the Lord aside and rebuked him. If you don't know what that means, it means he told Jesus he was wrong. Peter. Jesus said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but you're wrong. Why? Because Peter didn't think Jesus should be doing that. Peter thought he had a better idea. Peter hadn't died to himself yet. Jesus said, you will deny me three times, and Peter says, I'll never do that. What did Peter do? Denied him three times. When the rooster crowed and 
he saw the face of Jesus, what happened to Peter? He broke down. I don't have to ask you to imagine the shame and the guilt that Peter went through because many of you carry that right now. But Jesus told Peter, after Peter rebuked him, you can deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me or you can deny me. And what did Peter do? He denied Jesus. But that brokenness was a gift from God. Because then when Jesus rose from the grave, he went to Peter and what did he say? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? He denied him three times. Jesus restored him three times. But Peter, before he could be used by the Lord in Acts chapter 2, filled by the Spirit to preach a sermon that the Spirit used to draw 3,000 people to salvation, what had to happen in Peter's life first? He had to stop focusing on doing and self and start being with Jesus and realizing Jesus matters more than selfishness. And many of you have reached this kind of threshold, if you will, in your walk with Christ. And you feel like you can't go any further. Something's hindering you. And it very well could be the barrier of self and doing is what's holding you back. Because Jesus didn't save you for you to do. Jesus saved you to know him, to love him, and out of that knowing and being with him, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, Mary has chosen right. Have we? Have you? Are you so focused on doing you forgot to be? Because if so, Jesus has an invitation for you because when you just do all the time, you exhaust yourself. You will burn yourself out. And let me help you out. Jesus did not save you to then burn you out. He saved you so that you would know him and be with him. He saved you so you would have joy and peace unspeakable. And the rest we need is found only in Jesus. If you would, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. It'll be on the screen, but I want you to look at verses 28 through 30. This is from Jesus. To the people he was speaking to in Matthew 11, but to every believer today. Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I am lowly and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You might be here today and your burden does not feel light. Doing all the time has worn you out completely. It has exhausted you, and you feel more exhausted and tired and more guilt, guilty and shameful than you did before Christ because you feel like you're just not doing enough. That's not the yoke Jesus promised to put on you. Jesus promised to put on you a yoke that is easy, that will bring you rest. Jesus offers that to everyone today. You're not going to find rest in doing everything, and you just need that break. You just need to find the time. Jesus says you're not going to find it in the midst of doing. You're only going to find it when you learn to be with me. And how do we learn to be with Jesus? Because that sounds kind of, you know, almost supernatural, almost kind of superstitious, right? That's what the Bible calls us to do. He says, be still and know. Jesus says, there's rest for you today. Jesus says that you can come to him and find rest for your weary soul. Jesus says, you don't have to look any further. You can find it in me. Do you want rest today? Is that what you're longing for? Do you feel exhausted and burned out? 
Jesus didn't put a puzzle in front of you for you to figure out how to get rest or victory. See, in that escape room I was in with those boys, in every escape room you're in, there's always a little red button that you can push. And that little red button will instantly open the door. You'll get out, but you will take a loss. And you can't go back in. I was miserable. But I could have had relief if I just would have hit the button. If I would have admitted defeat and walked out. Today, the rest you're looking for is found in a person. And yes, you have to admit defeat and give absolute surrender to him. But you'll find rest for your weary soul. You know what the universal posture of surrender is? Hands raised. You know why we raise our hands and worship while the Bible calls us to do that? Absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. And to find rest today, it's not found in doing, it's not found in a puzzle, it's not found in doing all these different things, thinking this is what Jesus wants you to do. Jesus wants you to throw your hands up, surrender, admit you can't do it, and be with him. So what does Jesus want us to do this morning to find victory? He wants us to stop doing and start being. Stop doing and start being. This is what Jesus wants for you. This is what Jesus wants for all of those. If you're weary, exhausted, and broken, Jesus says, stop trying to do something to solve it and just be with me. Be with me. Sit under my word. Spend time with me in prayer. Listen for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Because you know what the Holy Spirit's going to do? He's always going to point you to Jesus. That's what Jesus said the point of the Holy Spirit coming was. For you to know him, to remember his words, and to be like him. But you can't do that if you're not being with Jesus. If you don't meet and listen for the Holy Spirit. You know, many of you know this past week I got to go to Longview, Texas for a prayer retreat. But let me tell you about my Tuesday morning. I woke up Tuesday. Got a text that my buddy was going to be late I was riding with. We left at 5 in the morning. And I'm, let me tell you this. If you ever want to go on a trip with me, don't schedule it at 5 in the morning. It's not going to be a good time. I get really cranky in the mornings. But, buddy and I rode together. About a few hours into the drive, I get a text message saying that a deacon from Holdenville, which is where I was the youth minister at for about six months, interim, had died suddenly. Wasn't, an old, wasn't, wasn't that old. Suddenly had a heart attack, I believe, and went to be with the Lord. Not a great way to start your day. Fast forward a little bit, get another text. The deacon from my last church at Gilead named Gary Williams, who was integral in bringing me there, he was on the search team. He was chairman of deacons when I got there. After a three-year battle with ALS, he died. Now that one hurt. Because Gary was the guy who called me every single week during COVID to make sure I was okay. Gary was the first one to show up to pray with me, to pray for God to do a revival in, this, in that church and to move in a way only he could. Then a few hours later, I get another text. A lady from First Baptist Inola named Miss Fern died too. Now Miss Fern holds a special place in my heart because when I was baptized, I was still at that point where I wasn't really what you call an extrovert. I didn't like being in front of people. So I was nervous. Somehow I thought I was going to mess it up. And she walked me up to the baptistry. She hugged me and she said, everything's going to be okay. And then when I surrendered to the ministry, she was the first person up to hug me and to say, God's going to do a great work in your life. Then when I preached my first sermon at that church, she was the first one to come hug me and tell me she's so proud of me. Tuesday was rough, guys. Tuesday was hard. But I'm going to say something that sounds weird. If that wouldn't have happened, I would not have heard from the Lord this past week. He broke me to the point where I didn't have the emotional bandwidth to ignore him. And so we're at this prayer retreat, and they made us do one thing in this prayer retreat that I just, it's going to be like a monthly thing now. They said, get four hours where you and the Lord get alone and do a deep cleanse. Now, during a deep cleanse, it's like this. You ever had something stuck on your hands, but you get a wire brush and scrub it out because it's so stuck? You know how raw your hand feels after that? Now, imagine that on your soul for four hours. 
It wasn't enjoyable, but it was great. And during that time, the Lord was slowly breaking me of certain sins I didn't even know I had. But they were hindering me. And so I went to the Lord and I started just being honest with him. I said, Lord, why aren't we seeing the 50 people saved and baptized that I saw at Gilead here? Like, we want to see revival here. Why are we not seeing the altars flooded with people wanting to give their lives to the Lord? What's missing? I'm kind of angry at this point. Because for weeks now, we've been feeling it. And I've been waiting for the match to drop, and it just hasn't. And the Holy Spirit very clearly in my heart said, Do you remember the 38th baptism at Gilead? Which is a weird number, but I did. The Holy Spirit said, What happened after that? I started to think, and that's when the interviews started. What are you doing different? How can we have this in our churches? That's when people from the Kentucky Baptist Convention started taking me to lunch and paying, by the way, just to pick my brain. And the Holy Spirit said, at that moment, you stopped building my kingdom and started building yours. And when Moses had the option to go into the promised land, but I would not be with him, Moses said no. And the Holy Spirit said, Rio, you didn't say no. You got real good at doing. You forgot to be. So I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what this looks like. I'm, you're just getting what's fresh on my heart from the Lord. I don't know what it means to have a lifestyle that is constantly more with Jesus than doing things for Jesus. But I'm willing to learn, are you? I'm tired of doing. I got real good at doing things. But I was exhausted. Holy Spirit showed me this past week, you don't have to be exhausted anymore. But you have to learn to be. So today, that's what I want to invite you to do. I'm going to ask you, I know we're not quite to the invitation yet, but here's the application. If you would just bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to do something with me that will hopefully help us learn to start being and to stop always doing. Psalm 46.10 says very clearly, be still and know that I am God. You ever wonder about what the Lord's telling us to do there? He's saying to stop everything. To stop letting your mind race. To stop being preoccupied with everything. To stop focusing on doing and just learn to be in the silence and listen. Because when the Holy Spirit spoke to Elijah, did he come as a fire, as a breeze? came as a still small voice this morning here's what I want you to do it's going to be an extended period of time with your head bowed and your eyes closed and just share and praying I want you to be still today and I want you to know that he is God here's what this means it means that as you with your head bowed and your eyes closed no agenda no praying just sit and learn to be with him. A good way to do this is to break down Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. And here in a few moments, I just want you to do that be still and to listen for that still small voice when the Holy Spirit speaks he will never contradict his word and if you want to know areas in your life where you're falling short he will show them for the purpose of restoring your joy in those areas if you find your mind wandering just say again be still but let's take a few moments and let's just be still before the Lord
still in the silence of your heart. And then she asked the Holy Spirit a hard question, but a good one. Holy Spirit, how am I grieving you in my life? Holy Spirit, what's the barrier keeping me from going forward? He'll show it to you. Now, I'm going to ask you, when he does show it to you, immediate obedience is what he's calling for. Immediate repentance. Don't argue with him. Don't justify it. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. And I give it to you. Confess and turn away. I'd also invite you, maybe this is a time where the Holy Spirit calls you to get on your knees before him. The problem with our church is oftentimes that we have soft knees and calloused hearts and we need calloused knees and soft hearts. If that's you, I invite you. Kneel where you're at, come to the altar. But immediate obedience. Ask the Holy Spirit with your head bowed and your eyes closed still. What is he calling you to do during this time of response? And then immediately obey when he does. That could mean that he reveals that you've hurt somebody. And your response is to go make a phone call and get that right right now. Could be someone in this church. Maybe God's calling you to come to the altar and pray. Immediate obedience. As the band comes up now, if he calls you to stand and to worship, then you stand and you worship. If you do not know the Holy Spirit, you don't know the Jesus that we're talking about, then the Holy Spirit today is calling you to come and be saved. You say, I don't know what that looks like. Well, this is not a prayer that if you repeat after me, it will save you, but here's an example cry out and say Lord I have sinned against you and I know I'm not right with you but I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and today I want that forgiveness and so today I'm placing my faith and my trust in Jesus alone as the Savior and Lord of my life to forgive me of all sin and knowing that if I call upon his name I will be saved so Lord save me today now, if that's what you need to pray today, I'm going to ask you very boldly to come forward. Again, this invitation time, I'm going to ask you to come and let me pray with you. Don't leave here today without being with Jesus any longer. Or maybe the Holy Spirit is calling you to recommit your life to Him today. To recommit your life to Christ. And to make that publicly known for your church family. If so, come and do it. Maybe your baptism has taken place on the wrong side of salvation or you've never been baptized. Is the Spirit calling you to follow through and be obedient with that today? Because the relationship with Jesus we're called to have happens when we learn to be with Him through the Holy Spirit He has sent. And then our doing flows out of being, not the other way around. So today in silence and simply being with the Lord, you don't have to stand in worship. You don't have to sit in silence. But I'm going to ask you as the band leads, you do what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do in the silence and solitude of your own heart and break through that barrier today that's keeping you from living in victory. Be with Jesus today. Because you were not created to be constantly doing, but to be with your God. So stop doing and start being.
Lord, we come to you and we ask simply that. Holy Spirit, make your presence known. Help us to be immediately obedient to what you call us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You do what the Spirit leads you to do during this time. It's come be.